FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's December 26, 2017. Hey, just five more days left to the end of the year. Hard to believe. Well, we've seen tremendous volatility in Bitcoin, and yet very little volatility in the stock market. Precious metals seem to be going up, as Eric Haddock had promised. He said that that the uh, for the December or maybe no, the February 2018 contract, it, once it went over 1265, that was a very bullish signal. Here we are. Well, is it going higher? Let's find out. But first, as always, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Be part of the show or tweet us at Kerry Lutz. And right, so precious metals, Bitcoin, stock market, what do we make of it? Here's John Rubino to discuss. Hey, Carrie. Well, I guess we could start with Bitcoin if you want, since uh, that yeah. was a pretty exciting week. <laughs> it's always exciting with Bitcoin. Let's face it. Uh, I hope you all had your seatbelts buckled because it was like a six or seven thousand uh, dollar fluctuation. Right. It was up close to eighteen thousand, John, nineteen thousand. And then it went yeah. down to ten four and then it went back up to sixteen. And in fact, let's take a look and see where it's at right this moment. Well, right this moment, it's 16,099. I mean, what do you make of this, John? Well, you know, I think I think it's kind of a funny parallel with gold, actually. And in uh, 2011, gold had its, you know, bubbly run and peaked at about $1,900 an ounce. And then it took it five years to correct down to 1100 Well, um, you know, one order of magnitude higher, Bitcoin did the same thing in a week. You know, it went up to, to 19000 and then dropped to 11000 before popping back up. So, uh, you know, we're, we're living in um, Internet time now where the uh, the most bubbly assets tend to make moves that, you know, used to play out over months or years uh, in weeks. And um, so who knows what happens from here on out? Because I, I think the, uh, the Bitcoin crash of the past week probably spooked a lot of people. But when when something is trending up by the dip is the dominant psychology. And that's what happened this time. You know, people saw it drop and decided, well, OK, I didn't miss this after all. Let me get in now mm -hmm. and have pushed it back up um, again. Who knows where this thing goes in the short run or the long run, for that matter. But right now, the uh, the trend is back to being positive, which means we could see some big gaps up going forward. You know, this thing moves in, in increments of a thousand thousand dollars at a pop, uh, which means we could finally break 20,000 this week or, you know, uh, another correction could set in. We could break 10,000. We just can't know with something that uh, is still relatively small in terms of uh, market cap and where there's an immense amount of paper wealth out there that's looking for a safe haven. You know, if you've got a stock portfolio right now, you've got to be kind of spooked because you've made so much money. You want to protect yeah. it somehow. Where do you go? Well, it, it seems like Bitcoin is one of the places where um, the, the money that people are taking profits in stocks. Look, um, so ah, who knows? <laughs> Fun to watch. <laughs> yes. Very difficult to speculate in. Well, you know, I wrote an article about it and bubbles are all about they. Yeah, sure. They deal with externalities, but they're you know what they're really about, John? They are really about about dopamine and about dopamine transmitters. Dopamine is that thing that when you get a reward, it gets released into your system. And that's why when you accomplish something, you do something great, you get this high. And when you're in a bubble, there's no greater reward than flashing the screen and every 15 minutes seeing you made a couple thousand dollars. And my whole point is the reason bubbles exist isn't so much uh, because because of external factors, although they certainly play a role, the Federal Reserve, what are they what are they doing with interest rates, right? I mean, definitely it's a factor. But I believe when you get down to all of it, it comes down to dopamine. And dopamine, we all want it. We all uh, are hooked on it because it gives you that euphoric feeling and and that's why these bubbles go so huge, blow so huge, and why irrationality 
really reigns supreme, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. But, but I just think this is really unfair, what's been happening in the last few years, because short sellers deserve a little dose of dopamine, too, right? <laughs> no, we, we, we I'll, I'll class myself as a short seller because I was really short at the, uh, the end of the housing bubble. Um, and that was such a rush to see these stocks that had just gone up and up and up, just find air pockets underneath them and just crash. You know, watching um, Citigroup fall to $3 a share w- was incredibly pleasurable. <laughs> and, you know, the short sellers of the world uh, are waiting for that to happen again. And, and uh, you know, we think it's our turn. It's about time that uh, that stuff like um, Tesla and Netflix and, and Bitcoin start plunging so we can have a little bit of fun too, you know? Fair is fair. Yeah, well, I guess uh, short sellers are entitled to their hit of dopamine as well. But lately, they haven't gotten it like for years. Hey, well, so what about Martin Armstrong's contention that the market is going higher still? He's been right all along. He hasn't been right about the timing because when I had him on three years ago, he said the market would double to 32,000 within a year. Well, we're three years later. It's it's closing in very quickly on 25K, which I think 25,000 is a very substantial number in a lot of ways because it's a resistance point a natural re, you know round numbers are always big big moments for the market although they could be they can be over uh, i guess uh, over importance put on them and but my feeling is that they do make a difference when it hits 25,000 there's no resistance above it is there well yeah M- martin armstrong is is a really interesting kind of outlier because uh, a lot of what you see now is um, valuation measures that show overvaluation in the market. And I'm looking at a few right now where, um, you know, if you look at trailing price earnings ratios, for instance, which have been a pretty good indicator of um, valuation for the market. In other words, when, when they get way out of whack, the market tends to crash. And, and uh, they, they exceeded 45 in the last two bubbles. And then the market basically collapsed right after that. Well, now we're at 50 with trailing PE ratios. So that indicator is screaming get out, you know, and, and it's been a fairly reliable indicator. And, and I've got another one here that's more obscure, but also interesting, which is uh, um, enterprise value for the S&P 500. In other words, what these companies are worth when you include their their uh, market cap, their equity market cap and their debt um, to free cash flow, which is the most important measure of corporate success that there is. And that's at record levels now, too. It's never been this high. In other words, corporations have never been this expensive before. Yeah. So looking at and their success in the past and predicting big crashes, you got to be really worried. But then Martin Armstrong says that there's something different this time, and that is that the rest of the world is in even worse shape than us. And their money has to go somewhere when things fall apart. You know, he thinks Europe is going to have a bond crisis pretty soon, where basically the eurozone experiment fails. And there are trillions and trillions of, of dollars or of euros of, of um, capital that can move around the world when that happens. Well, where is it going to go? And his thesis is that it goes into U.S. equities because, you know, we're, we're relative to them <laughs> in pretty yeah. good shape. China borrowed absolutely insane amounts of money for developing countries. Yeah, China crisis now really with. went over over the top. China is like, forget it. They have the yeah. money supply of $35 trillion now. Right. Yeah. I mean, their debt um, quintupled (laughs) in like five years. You know, that's that's something that no system can handle in in the sense that no system can um, productively invest that much new capital without just screwing it up, you know, and and buying things and building things that shouldn't be bought or built. Um, And and so their new millionaires really want to get their money out of the country, which is part of why Bitcoin has been soaring, because Chinese are using uh, Bitcoin as a way to move money out of the country. And the Chinese government is reacting to that with capital controls, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, that that money's going to get out if it needs to get out. So you've got these two very big systems that are in worse shape than us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, much worse shape. And and so they see, you know, IBM stock or Google stock or or uh, um, Amazon as safe havens, places where they put their money in and have a reasonable degree of expectation that they'll get their money back at some point and maybe even more than they put in. Whereas at home, they don't have that sense of security. So they're they're looking at us and, and seeing, you know, these stocks as being richly valued, but but still a better deal than than what they've got at home. And Martin Armstrong, his contention is that um, that's going to give us one more big leg up 
in U.S. equity valuations. And, and that we shouldn't worry about these old indicators because they, they did their thing. They sent their signals in a different world. And today, there's no place else to go but U.S. equities. And so we're going to see them get much, much more expensive before they have their their collapse, which will come, but it, it won't come right away. Yeah. And that's an interesting thesis. And he's been right, like you said. So I don't he know. He has been right. I don't know. He has been right. You know, like in the final analysis, you know, theoretic, the theory underlying his, his, uh, his, prognostications his forecasts uh, might be subject to challenge but in the final analysis nobody that i've seen has called the market uh like he has so yeah now one other thing about this though is that in every cycle there's somebody that seems to get it right Right. and they make a big name for themselves uh, and, and then they make a, an extreme prediction based on kind of the hubris that comes from being right a few times. Right. And they're wrong. And then they kind of fall by the wayside, you know, and usually it's a technical analyst. There, there are a lot of big technical analysts who um, who um, made predictions based on their charts. And then when they got famous and they made a big prediction on a global stage, their charts didn't work and, and they're not really taking that seriously anymore. Uh, so. I, I, you know, the question with Martin Armstrong is, which one is he? You know, is he the guy who who sees that it's different correctly, or is he the guy who has made a few good predictions and then makes a big one and turns out to be wrong? You know, we can't know this stuff until after the fact. Well, the one um, thing though, well, he's made a lot of uh, predictions that have proved right mm -hmm. in the past. A lot. He's not just oh, yeah. a, a one hit wonder like uh, like your bands from the '60s. He's been consistent and his, his calls have always been controversial and always been poo-pooed by the, by the mainstream. And yet he's been right way more than he's been wrong. So I'm not saying that it's going to happen this time at all. I don't know that. But the case that he makes for it, John, is pretty, pretty compelling. And yeah. combine that with his track record... And I wouldn't want to be betting against him, but many, many uh, technical guys are saying that the market is at or close to a peak and expect increased volatility and, you know, all sorts of uh, bad things to happen to it. Um, the other thing is, and I asked uh, Charles Nenner this, he's another cycle guy. I mean, they're very close in their in their fundamental underpinnings. It doesn't mean that that uh, that they have the same forecast. They don't. They're very different. But Nenner says is like, well, yeah, everybody could be thinking that they have no alternatives, but the market could still go down. <laughs> I thought it was like, well, you know, Kerry, you know, approaching this rationally and, and in terms of valuation, you would say that gold and silver would be the big beneficiaries of this, right? Right. Rationally, because we're not. There, <laughs> there are perceived as havens at down. You know, you, you look at the um, historical valuation differences between um, Google stock and silver. And and if you assume that the world is going to shift towards safe haven investing in the future, you would say silver is a way better deal than Google, right? Yeah. Uh, perhaps, you know, it, it, we, we can't know this again until it, after it's done playing out. But, uh, but I, I think the dynamic that makes people buy Google and Amazon stock at these valuation levels ought to help precious metals to an even greater degree because they're more undervalued, but they're also historically successful safe havens in times of crisis. So you would think this would be a phenomenal environment for precious metals and that the um, the idea that the rest of the world is going to devolve into chaos and all the capital there is going to be looking for places to hide, that should be phenomenally good for gold and silver. One uh, the market's not behaving that way quite yet. One would think, uh, but, you know, the market always uh, seeks to frustrate the majority of its participants, right? We agree on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this is exactly a case where that's happened for a long time. And once once the uh, technicals get so bad for gold, which I think they have, and silver even worse, then then all of a sudden it moves and who knows what can happen? Who knows? It's it's a remarkable time to be alive and to be watching all this stuff, John, you know, uh, because. Oh, yeah, Carrie, we're living through the most amazing stretch of financial history ever. And, uh, and you know, it's going to end extremely badly. I don't think anybody that, that we watch, you know, there, there aren't any um, um, 
I mean, it's just a question of how does it play? You know, how does that bad outcome happen and on what time scale and what goes up and down in the meantime? You know, that's those are the big questions. And those are important questions for uh, for trying to make money over the next five or 10 years. Right. But I, I think you and I agree. And, and most of the people we talk to seem to agree that 10 years from now, things are not going to be good in the world. And the people who take steps to protect themselves now, even if it means missing out on some of the easy money that you get in tech stocks during a bubble, um, will be the ones who are the most successful and have the most capital at that time. You know, but getting from here and here to there is really a difficult intellectual challenge right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it requires going against the conventional wisdom requires you to be a contrarian. And there's a reason why contrarians aren't the major thought leaders, if you will. Well, they might be the major thought leaders, but there's a contrarians by nature cannot be in the majority, John. Right. They can't be because they're right. contrarians. If you're a contrarian by nature, that means that you don't believe what the uh, herd is doing is correct. And, you know, that can be a very profitable means of investing, but you don't want to be right at the wrong time because that is out and out dangerous. And that could be existential, uh, you know, an existential uh, crisis for you if you're right at the wrong time. But I know I'm right. You know, the market sometimes markets always right. It's just the market can change its mind because it's fickle. So just because you think you're right doesn't make you right. Well, if you um, watch the movie The Big Short, it, it chronicles some people who were phenomenally successful at investing for the uh, the bursting of the housing bubble. But they were only successful at the very end of the process for the, the, the few years that they were involved in that bet. In other words, betting that um, housing prices were going to collapse and the big banks were going to um, go down, their share prices were going to go down and maybe they were going to go bankrupt. You know, that that bet worked out at the end. But for maybe three years, these guys were losing money and their clients were pulling money out of their hedge yeah. funds. Right. Their face because uh, because, you know, obviously everything was great. And here they are betting against the system that's firing on all cylinders. And, and so this was a really traumatic experience for most of them. Uh, oh, yeah. But in the end, they stuck with it and and they were you know, successful enough to be profile Hollywood movie, right? <laughs> but okay. that's the way bubbles work. Um, when when you identify it as a bubble and you start betting against it, you probably have another couple of years or more before it turns out to be right, if, if indeed it ever turns out to be right. You know, so far, betting against these bubbles that have been blowing up, you know, at least since the gold and silver bubble of 1980 and then the the junk bond bubble of the late 80s and the tech stock bubble of the 90s and the housing bubble of the 2000s, uh, you were right to bet against all of them, but you had to get the timing right. Yeah. And if you were way too early, you lost your shirt because those things had parabolic increases in the year before they collapsed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You and know, so when you talk about the big short, they're like being cursed out by their investors. You oh. idiot. You don't know anything. Blah, blah, blah. And and they said, just wait, just wait. You'll see. And then when it came, it was like, oh, I guess you were right. <laughs> it was yeah. really funny. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a really funny scene in that movie where after the collapse, uh, one of the hedge fund guys who, who made a fortune after uh, you know being yelled at for two years by his clients and everything, he made a fortune by hanging in there. And then at the bottom, he's buying equities. But one of his clients are calling him up saying, why are you buying equities? They're going down forever. you know. <laughs> uh, so he, he can't win with his clients because he's always um, going against the tide, which is the correct thing to do. But it's always painful to do that in the moment. You know, because the the uh, the trends don't turn on a dime the way you wish they would. They tr they continue for a while, which gives you a, a chance to get in. But you look wrong while you're doing it. You know, and and yeah. the people who are just looking at the trend and saying that that's the the new normal. You know, that it's always going to be like that. Think you're an idiot. So, so you have to be. Yeah. You have to really have a strong sense of who you are to be able to invest um, against bubbles as yeah. they're expanding. And that's kind of what today is. You know, we've got to get the timing right. If we want to short uh, bubble assets and then make a fortune when the bubble bursts, uh, we either have to get the timing perfectly, which is impossible, or be too early for a while and feel stupid. You know, those are your only two yeah. choices. And uh, that's, I think, the way a lot of short sellers feel now. You know, they, they've been going short for a long time. Mm-hmm. 
you look at John Hussman or somebody like that, who's a brilliant guy, but who's been negative about this market for several years. brilliant enough. Yeah. And it just keeps on going up. Yeah. Well, so then then you you look at Nassim Taleb's strategies here, John, which is make small bets with huge potential payoffs and keep making them, keep spreading them out. So as the next one expires, make the next bet. And it's worked for him in spades. So it's like the difference here is when you're at the table in Vegas and you're making the big bets at the craps table or the roulette wheel, what happens is that even when you win, you lose because you don't get paid true odds. On Wall Street, you're going to win because, and this is the beauty of it, you're going to win because you're getting paid more than the true odds because there is no reliable method of measuring when these crashes are going to come and what their cost is going to be. So that's that's the beauty of it, uh, that you can you can do it, but you need to really plan this out incredibly well. You need to be a pro. And, and in fact, you can get discounted odds because what you're betting on, it's just like if you were betting on Trump winning and you went to went to the odds makers, you can't do it uh, in the U.S. because it's illegal. But they were paying like 50 to one odds. And in fact, Patty's the fam- most famous turf accountant. That's what they call bookies in England in the UK, paid off the bets early on Hillary Clinton. That was when I knew for sure that Trump was going to win because they had it was nothing to lose there by doing it. Uh, but I knew that they had grossly mismanaged the book and they were going to pay the price. But they do have means of reinsuring their bets, if you will. So, But that was when I was absolutely sure Trump was going to win. When I saw Patty's pay off their bets, I said, uh, oh, this is... This is it. And sure enough. So it's hard to uh, bet on the inevitable, but uh, some type of crash becomes more inevitable, John, by the day, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, but, but that, you know, I've thought it was imminent for, for a couple of years now. <laughs> so I- inevitable and imminent are, are the, the two things that you have to get right. Right. You yeah. don't want to mistake one for the other <laughs> just because something's going to happen. You don't yeah. want to bet on it happening tomorrow because that, that's the thing you can't know unless you have some inside information. Uh, and yeah. And and. Right now, we're in one of those stages, and those these stages have happened in every bubble where a lot of rational analysts decide that this is it. This thing has to blow up because it can't go any further. And uh, so, you know, in, two, in 1998, you go short tech stocks. Well, they double before the end of uh, 2000 when they really crash, and you lose a fortune, you know, and, and this is that time for short sellers. But it is going to crash. You can't have valuation levels like this be sustained forever because it's um, it, it, it you don't get a return on your capital because that's what valuation measures measure. You know, what kind of a return do you get when you buy a dollar's worth of a company's earnings? You know, how much do you have to pay for that dollar and over what time scale? Do, do future earnings pay you back on your initial investment? Uh, the higher the valuation, the longer the time scale in which you have to hang in there and things have to go right for you to get paid back. And we're at the point now where uh, it's a really long time. <laughs> you know, if you if you buy the average stock in the S&P 500 right now, you're going to have to wait a really, really long time before the, the subsequent cash flows make it worth your while. Absolutely. Uh, and historically, that's not a good place to invest, you know, because you, you want to wait till it goes down and then invest so that the cash flows pay you back right away. Uh, you know, we're not in that time frame now. Well, uh, so. what, what Taleb says, and it goes to a little bit of statistics, but, you know, we don't get heavily deep into the weeds on that. But what he says is that the the players in the market basically are are assessing risk in accordance with standard deviations on the table, so the bell curve. So what you are saying is going to happen is such an outlier, they can't possibly ever price it correctly. And then when it does happen, boy, it's it's hallelujah, hallelujah time, because maybe the odds of happening it were one in a hundred, but your bet is paying off one 
is paying off 10,000 to one. So you've made a hundred times more than what was the risk that was priced into the system. I mean, there's a very simplistic explanation of it, but that's really the way it works when you, when you get down to it is you're getting better than house odds. And that's why, but it's not like the gambler's fallacy, which is if I keep doubling my bet, eventually I'll win money at the table. That's called the Martindale, Martingale system. Just keep doubling your bet. As you lose, you lose a dollar, bet two, lose again, bet four, bet eight, bet 10, bet 12. Eventually you have to win, but actually you're doubling it. So you lose eight, bet 16, 32, 64, 128, blah, blah, blah. Uh, This is different because the event that you're betting on virtually has to happen right? It has to happen. It's just that the time premium, right? Because when you're buying an option or you're buying out in the future, you're paying a time premium, right? But because that time premium is so underestimating the risk in the market, that's how you make a fortune at it. But you have to plan this out and spread the money out. Ordinary investors, you can't do it. All you could do is hope to go to a fund that is doing it and that the fund doesn't go bankrupt before the momentous day happens. I mean, you know, what you said about the big short and the players there, the immense pressure they were under. And finally, the guy just suspends all distributions, withdrawals from the hedge fund and says, no, you're in this. You're not getting out. And they freak out and they threaten to sue him and everything else. But within a couple of months, it all works out. And we're going to we're going to have this at some point of that. There's no question. Even Martin Armstrong agrees. The only question question is when. So you need to make a two to three year horizon if you're going to play this short, because it could be two to three years, John. Well, that, that's how it's worked out in the past. Uh, you, you hit a valuation level that screams bubble, you know, sell your stocks and then turn around and short every stock you can. You hit that level uh, and then it goes on for another two years and equities double from there. Um, with that, which is the nature of bubbles. They get irrational and they have a, a parabolic blow off at the very top and everything. So if you're just looking at historical valuation measures, you're too early. Uh, now, you could make the case that that point was passed two or three years ago based on current valuation measures. In other words, um, we're, we're at the point now where the guys who got in three years ago or shorted the market three years ago should be getting their reward. <laughs> and But we've got this whole foreign capital inflow thing that, that is fairly unique. You know, it hasn't happened in the past at the peaks of bubbles. Uh, so that's a wild card. Plus, we've got the world's central banks with unlimited printing presses who are, are just sitting out there waiting to buy equities in the case of a, a market correction. You know, they're terrified that the system won't be able to handle um, a, a garden variety bear market. You know, a 20% drop in equities is something that happens all the time. Good for the market. And it, it, it's like a small forest fire. It has a very useful function in market-based economies. But the governments of the world are afraid that that small forest fire this time around is going to turn into a, a global conflagration that just basically wipes out the existing systems. So they don't want to let that happen. So so you have several things that are unique this time around. You know, foreign capital flows, you've got governments with unlimited printing presses, and you've also got the, the willingness of corporations to borrow money at zero and then buy back their stock in, in a really aggressive way that we've never seen on this scale before. So you've yeah. got a lot of, um, you know, new stuff that might change the calculus for equity valuations and and for bond valuations. And don't forget, we just had a tax bill passed that encourages and will no doubt increase the very behavior that you're discussing. One thing I wanted to cover about that tax cut is the repatriation provisions. Now, there's a misnomer that somehow that money is in a big lockbox overseas. Stranded U.S. corporation profits, $4 trillion worth, is sitting in a lockbox like your social Social Security contributions are in a big lockbox. So it'll never go broke because, you know, we put in so much. Another issue. But it's sitting $4 trillion in a lockbox. And therefore, people, uh, the companies will bring repatriate the money. And that's going to be a good thing. And it will for tax collections because there's a 15 and a half percent discounted repatriation fee for that money. So they're definitely going to do it. But the reason they're doing it, John, has nothing to do with the money being here nor there. It 
enables them to put the profits back into the company, pay a discounted tax rate, and thereby lower a liability on their balance sheets for deferred taxes because they figured the taxes in at 35 percent. Now they're only paying 15 and a half. So that is plus they get to deduct the foreign taxes that they paid, which nobody ever talks about. So that greatly reduces the actual 15 percent, cuts it way down point is that where do they put that money now, John? Do you know where they put it? Into treasuries. They buy the treasuries from their overseas subsidiary, or they open up Apple Ireland Inc., opens a bank account at J.P. Morgan Chase and puts all that money in there and gets whatever investment deals Chase provides to multi-billion dollar depositors. That's what's happening to the money. It's not like it's not here. So the idea that it's going to somehow be invested in the U.S. and it's not already is a misnomer. But it does have the potential that they'll pull it out of treasuries once it's here, because why have it in treasuries, right? Uh, there's no reason to have it there. And, and that could affect interest rates on the point there. But when you got that much money, you got to put the money someplace. Bonds seem like a very rational, rational place to put them, right? Yeah. Um, and I think if you give corporations more money to play with, we, we also know that they're going to buy back a lot of their stock because that's what they've been doing with corporate profits over the last few years. And that kind of financial in engineering does lead to other things being equal, higher share prices, but it leads to huge amounts of new leverage for companies. So yeah. to the extent that they um, they have new cash coming in from a, a lower corporate tax rate, although they don't really pay the top marginal rate now, you know, so it's not clear exactly how much money they get. Um, they will take a lot of that and buy their own stock back probably. Yeah, to some extent. They will yeah. share the wealth, wealth a little bit because it's going to be horrible PR for your average uh, multinational company, like for instance, AT&T, they have an effective tax rate in the 30 plus percent range. So their profits were somewhere around 7 billion last year. So their pro their taxes are going down like they're, they're getting back over $6 billion. Assume their profitability holds up for next year. So 6 billion, if they didn't do things for their employees and just went on a on an M&A spree, man, you would just have people howling, especially now they want to buy Time Warner cable and Trump doesn't want them to. So by giving out a thousand dollar pop bonus to a couple hundred thousand employees really makes them look benevolent and public spirited. They're really doing what's best for the country, blah, blah, blah. But you know, this is, this is more than just being good guys. It's being good guys, getting credit for it in the hopes that Trump will approve their merge, their upcoming merger with Time Warner, which Time Warner owns CNN. We all know that Trump has has some issues with CNN, right? I mean, do you see the beauty of this, John? Like, uh, you know, managing public perception. But nonetheless, those people got a thousand are getting a thousand bucks a head and nobody can can complain about that. Right. Well, um, I mean, I think they would complain if they understood how the accounting works because <laughs> um, corporate M&A, in other words, when one company buys out another company using extremely cheap debt, um, that has the same effect as corporate share repurchases. It's just a, a company buying another company's stock instead of buying their own stock. It, it has the effect of raising the valuation of corporate assets out there, which is enriches the, the corporate class in general, right? And that's another thing you see at the peak of cycles. You see companies buying themselves or buying each other out to build empires. And usually the, the peak of the cycle acquisitions turned out to be a really bad idea. So I, I think the same will happen now. You know, these big M&A deals that we're, we're seeing now will be quietly unwound <laughs> to, at, at the, the bottom of the cycle because that's how it always works, you know? And I, everybody's looking for the um, the AOL Time Warner deal, in other words, the big deal that rings a bell at the top of the cycle, and who knows, maybe this is it. I you think know, it's it. Basically, the same assets in play. I think it's it. I think yeah, it's totally uh, it's totally deja vu all over, John. To quote or paraphrase the late great, I think he died, Yogi Berra. In mm -hmm. any event, uh, hey, that's it for this week. We've run over our time, but. Uh, 
Look, go take a look at John's site, dollarcollapse.com. It's all there. Exactly what we've been talking about. Take a look at Financial Survival Network as well. We reprint a lot of John's work. And don't forget, be part of the show. Love to get your emails. It It means so much. Even if you say you hate it, I still appreciate it just to know you're listening. And look, uh, kl at kerrylutz.com is the email address. The Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz and the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. John, we're going to catch up with you next week. Oh, email newsletter going out in the next day or so. I swear to God. All right, John, we'll catch up with you. Be well. Okay, Kerry, you too. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.